hey, it's Drew. And I'm guessing that as a podcast listener, you also enjoy audiobooks. Well, in that case, did you know the audio version of Renegade Marketing 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands was recently ranked the number one new B2B audio book by B2B Authority? Kind of cool, right? Anyway, you can find my book on Audible or your favorite audiobook platform. And speaking of audio, before we get into today's show, I do want to do a shout out to the professionals that share your genius. We started working with them several months ago to make this show even better and have been blown away by their strategic and executional prowess. If you're thinking about starting a podcast or want to turbocharge your current show, be sure to talk to Rachel Downey at shareyourgenius.com and tell her Drew sent you. Okay, let's get on with today's episode. Hello, Renegade Marketers. Welcome to Renegade Marketers Unite, the top-rated podcast for B2B CMOs and other marketing-obsessed individuals. You're about to listen to a recording of CMO Huddle Studio, our live show featuring the CMOs of CMO Huddles, a community that's sharing, caring, and daring each other to greatness every day of the week. This time, we've got a conversation with Huddler's Grant Johnson of Bill Trust, Marka Armstrong of Passport, and Tejo Parekh, then CMO of Terminal, on customer marketing. Amazingly good insights, so let's dive in. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, live from my home studio in New York City. We are hearing the warning signs and CMO huddles as CFOs once again become CFNOs, tightening the purse strings, delaying purchases, and challenging CMOs to do more with less. But here's the good news. Some of us have been here before, weathered the storm, so to speak, and figured out how to thrive even when the sinking tide lowers the opportunities for others. How? Well, first, you need to make sure your brand is considered essential in the minds of your customers, customers who need who you need to retain, rely on for advocacy, and hopefully upsell and cross-sell if that's an option for your business. And how do you do all that? Well, fortunately for you, we have three amazing CMOs with us today ready to share their experience and insights into what we'll call customer marketing. So with that, let's bring on Tejo Parekh, CMO of Terminal. Hey, Tejo, how are you? Tejo, how are you? Very good. Excited to be here. Well, it's good to have you. And, though, and where are you? I'm actually uh, taking this from uh, from Michigan. Uh, as you know, normally I'm based out of uh, San Francisco Bay Area, but just visiting some family in Michigan. So I was looking at your LinkedIn profile again and noticed that you got your MBA from the prestigious University of Chicago, which has a reputation of being pretty intense. And these with T-shirts saying, you Chicago, where fun comes to die. So tell us a little bit about your experience there. I know that it has the reputation of being a very intense uh, uh, place, but uh, my experience was quite the opposite. Uh, amazing. Probably business school was the only school where fun did not <laughs> go to die. We actually had a lot of fun. Very collegial, very uh, social environment, uh, uh, lots of social hours. So honestly, I could never relate to uh, where fun comes to die t-shirts. I can see where the school gets. Yeah, so we're just going to have to do University of Chicago Business School, where fun happens every day. All right, well, that's very cool. Now, you had a bachelor's of pharmacy, which uh, is a little unusual background for a marketer. Talk a little bit about how you started there. Did your parents say you're going to be a pharmacist? Or, you know, and first, how'd you get there? And then, was there any value in that in preparing you as a marketer? Yeah, I know. I was, uh, I grew up interested in sciences and, uh, you know, pharmacy seemed like a really good option at the time. Uh, no parental or any pressure. Otherwise it was uh, completely, uh, you know, self-driven. 
But at the same time, you know, a couple of years of doing that, I did realize that being in lab, that kind of role did not quite suit me. But it did uh, provide really good, good foundation for what marketers, a lot of marketers are, you know, experts at today. For example, you know, it allows you to or trains you to to develop this approach uh, where you're constantly thinking about hypothesis, develop hypothesis test it out, the experimentation mindset. As you know, the world of marketing has evolved so much in the last couple of decades that CMOs who can take that approach uh, have a much better chance of, uh, uh, you know, making their businesses successful. That was a really good foundation to to build on. No, and I, I love it. And, and you know, I talk about this in my book, the whole fourth part of the CAT framework is scientific method, which is exactly that, as you described, is creating hypothesis and testing it. And, you know, go so far as to recommend that CMOs have 10 to 20% of their budget earmarked for their experiments, because you never know when those experiments might become the full part of the larger part of the program. Okay, well, speaking of the larger part of the program, where does customer far marketing fit into your overall marketing program? Sure. You know, I'm going to take a step back and talk about essentially what four core areas we typically think about as CMOs uh, when it comes to customer marketing and of those which are applicable to us today at Terminal. So if you think about customer marketing, depending on the business, depending on the product and your, your target audience, you're either looking at driving adoption of the product, you know, growing footprint, uh, or you're looking at cross-sell, upsell, which you talked about earlier, Drew. Uh, third pillar is you're looking at driving retention. How do you make those uh, customers sticky and continue to, to uh, get the you know, most value out of them? And the last one is customer advocacy, which is where I would even cab and some of those elements under customer advocacy. And so based on where we are today at Terminal, the two core pillars that we focus on, at least uh, in terms of marketing that, that my team focuses on, is partnering with our with our with our account executives and account management team on cross sell upsell and doing that in a scalable way or helping them do that in a scalable way and uh, we're squarely prioritizing we're squarely focused on uh, customer advocacy we just set up cab and you know cab is a great way it's one of the most effective mechanisms to identify and turn your customers into advocates so that is, again, one of those things where if you think about, for us at Terminal, growing the brand presence, establishing ourselves as thought leaders is critical for us at this stage. And if you think about that, customer advocacy cap, all of those initiatives ladder up to essentially the, the overarching goal of growing our presence in the market. So uh, just in case someone um, doesn't know what CAB is, it's Customer Advisory Board. And the idea of a Customer Advisory Board is that you actually select these individuals who help you with your think about roadmap, maybe even think about source them for decisions in terms of overall marketing. I and mean, there's a lot of uses for customer for CABs, as you, you use that term. Let's just talk about that for a second, because I think a lot of... I mean, I and we we had a two huddles in the last two days, and I would say about, about half had customer advisory boards. And you mentioned that you just set yours up. So, what are the steps that you need to do to even get one up and running? I'll, I'll talk about it at a at a high level overarching framework that one would need in order to set it up. You do need a strategic imperative within the organization for setting up the cab. Most times there is one, uh, like I just gave you an example of why it's important to do that at, uh, at Terminal. In general, when, when, does, when one does think about setting up cab, there's the strategic need for it. There's the, do we have enough happy customers who can 
participate in that kind of a forum and who can essentially provide that feedback, who feel comfortable providing that feedback. So I think your makeup of customers or whatever have you is is also equally important. And then I think in addition to that, internally, uh, as if this falls under marketing, then, you know, the right marketing owner that is walking in lockstep with product, with your customer account management team to ensure that some of those goals are being met as well, that there is a very solid set of goals, requirements that we're putting forth in that forum. You've got to treasure their time and we've got to be really buttoned up with uh, with what kind of questions we're going to them for or how are we going to use their time. But I think right. some of the examples that you mentioned, ensuring that uh, uh, we are getting their input on product roadmap is important. But in order to do that, we need to make sure that we do have a solid roadmap that right. we can uh, serve up, right? I, I know I'm giving a broader... No, that's helpful. Around. It's great. It's it's funny you mentioned the happy customers thing because in a huddle yesterday, one of the CMOs was looking to develop this and was given a list of uh, what were, they thought were happy customers for marketing to call about this. And it turned out all that customer, well, a couple of them just did was rant. <laughs> so you're like, oh, well, gee, if these are supposedly the happy customers, you may have a problem. But either way, the initiative to start developing a cab is really a customer advisory board is a great first step because if, if you can't have, find enough customers to do that, you have a problem. All right. Anyway, we're going to bring on Marka Armstrong now, CMO of Passport and uh, get her input. Hello, Marka. Hey, Drew. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you and where are you? So I am terrific. Thank you for asking. And I am in Passport's headquarters, which is located in beautiful Charlotte, North Carolina. All right. So, okay. We've got three states covered uh, so far, Chicago, Illinois, and I'm sorry, Michigan, New York, and North Carolina. Now, I was digging around in your LinkedIn profile and noticed that you were a four-year varsity lacrosse player at Mount Holyoke. That must have been fun. So I love, Drew, how you dig around people's LinkedIn profiles, by the way. I just need to call that out. Um, and yes, it was fun. I think anytime you have a chance to be outside and chase a ball and be with other people, what's not fun about that? So I certainly enjoyed myself. One of the things that I sort of really come to respect among the, you know, the college athletes, I have to say, I know more women college athletes who... The, the lessons in time management, because these are, it's not like you're going to Mount Holyoke and then you're going to be a professional lacrosse player. I mean, this is a 25 to 40 hour side hustle while you have your full time job of being a student. Now, I'm thinking you must have gotten pretty good at time management. So definitely time management. I think anybody who is a student athlete has to know how to manage their time. But what I would also add to that, it's about focus and discipline right? You can show up at practices five days a week, go to games on Saturdays, take Sundays off, or you can meet with your teammates on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in the gym before class and go on a long run after a game so that you can be faster, stronger, swifter than the next person on the field. So it's really up to you to decide how you're going to engage. And ultimately what you put into the effort is what you're going to get out of it. And, and I'm guessing ready. you took the latter approach. I may have done that. <laughs> That's guessing. All right. Well, let's now get to, well, we'll switch subjects here and let's talk about customer marketing and how does that fit into your overall plan? Sure. So for folks on the call who are not familiar with Passport, um, we are a company that sells mobility software and payment services and our clients are municipalities. So at the end of the day, really, our marketing plan is all about the customer. And it's about, and I know we talked about happy customers a second ago, but I'd like to use the term that our client success VP talks about, which is we want to surprise and delight our clients so that they become not just happy, but fanatically happy is what she likes to call them. So at the end of the day, they're clients that we can not only upsell and cross sell to, but they also become advocates and we can help sell to people that are in our pipeline. And so fanatically happy, how do you measure that? 
there's a couple of different things that we have on a dashboard. What is the use kick? Again, because we're a software company. So how are people using our product? We've got a stoplight. I'm sure a lot of people do. Red, green, yellow. Is it red? If it's red, we got a problem. If it's yellow, what are we looking for in terms of the stability of the, of the platform? How is it being used? How many users are on it, et cetera, et cetera. That's one, that's one way that we measure a client's happiness with us. Um, the other is, you know, what is their likelihood to, to buy? So if they buy one product from us, are they ready to buy another? How many products do they have? Do they have the full suite of product? So that would be another way. You know, we've got a churn report that we look at. If somebody churned, why? You know, what happened? Did somebody come in and was it a price game? So there are a number of different things that we have on a dashboard that we look at on a regular basis. And when you think about sort of marketing in that context, we have a set of customers and we know what we want them to be. We want them to be fanatically happy uh, and advocate on your behalf. What are some of the things that, that you are doing specifically um, to sort of get that, or at least as you, you, you know they're here, you're trying to get them to ha- there. Sure. So during the pandemic, you know, for all of us lived through this for the past two years, at the very beginning of the pandemic, municipalities shut down, right? Everybody just went inside. Nobody was out on the street. Nobody was going to restaurants. Nobody was using transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And when you're in the mobility business and you're helping people figure out where to park and you're helping ride share services, figure out how to move about a city, and all of a sudden nobody's doing that, you've got to find a way and a reason to communicate with your clients. So at the very beginning, March of 2020, and that was right around the time that I started with Passport, the whole notion was how do we talk to our clients around business continuity? What's going to help them get back in business? So we started a series of webinars with clients around the country. And then the webinars actually turned into customer advocacy groups. I know we were just talking about a, an advisory group, but these advocacy groups were actually regional. And we came up with a topic and we said, okay, what's important to the folks in the Northeast as compared to the folks in the, into the, in the Northwest or the Southwest, Texas, Southeast, that kind of thing. Weather played a big factor. When you start talking to people in the, South, um, in the Southeast or in Southern California, what was happening is curbs were being, re-utilized, were being utilized as outdoor restaurant spaces, right? And so how do you take a topic like that? And they called them parklets. How do you take a topic like that and have a conversation with folks, for, for, for example, in the Northeast? How can they take advantage of it? So it's coming up with conversation pieces that get people engaged and then they can learn from each other. And then if you as the vendor become the people that are actually engaging in that conversation or facilitating that dialogue, people look to you for what else do you know? How else can you help me? And so that has become a program that we've continued. And now that we're, you know, waning on the from a pandemic perspective and comfortable being together again, we've actually taken it on the road and done some in-person events in the same kind of fashion. And the feedback has been extraordinary. And people have said, you know, we actually like your events more so than the industry events because they actually give us an opportunity to talk to each other. Clients can talk to each other. We bring in thought leaders and it's, it's a great way for people to become advocates, not just a passport, but supporters of each other. You know, and what I'm thinking about on several levels, several interesting thoughts. One is, I'm not saying you're, you sponsored interesting thoughts, not I have interesting thoughts. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Yeah. So <laughs> one is that when you're doing customer marketing right, you are essentially building community because you're helping them come together over common uh, interests. And that's an important just thing to park for a moment. But one of the things that also we talk a lot about in huddles and I talk about it in my book is that you essentially were giving away anything you could in order to keep them engaged while this very difficult time, right? Cause this was a really challenging period of time. And I remember early on in huddles, cause we started huddles April 1st, one of the CMOs right away said, you know, the more we give, the more we give away, the more we seem to sell. And I thought, so interesting. And I just want to, before we move on, just talk about how do you, when you look at all those webinars and those programs that you did, particularly in the period where there really wasn't a lot to sell, how do you sort of connect those dots from, you know, I'm thinking of your conversation with the CEO, trust me, there will be sales at some point here. How I connect the dots from all these webinars and the roadshows and the things to revenue? 
Yeah. So I think that the key point there is what is marketing's connective tissue to products and then the connective tissue to the pipeline, right? So at the end of the day, when you have these roadshows or you have these advocacy groups, et cetera, ultimately, what is the opportunity to upsell, right? Where are those people in the pipeline? Where are they on the dashboard? And then when you think about the upsell opportunity is what is in the pipeline that can be in, be advantageous to that client. So, you know, I was just in a conversation earlier today about fleet management, for example. And right. so, you know, what is the opportunity to upsell a client from a parking solution that they have on street to a fleet sol fleet sol solution? And where is that client? And if you bring them to an advocacy, advocacy conversation, whereby all of a sudden other people are talking about fleet management and what a pain in the tail it is with all of the Amazon trucks that are clogging the Upper East Side. I don't know if you're the Upper East or Upper West or where you are in New York. But it's just, it's yeah, right. You can't get through anywhere. So what's the conversation that you have with city leaders in New York City around help, help me um, help you solve this problem of congestion? And right. then when people start to hear about how that problem has been solved, then all of a sudden, then there's like, oh, hey, I can actually go be a hero in my city and go solve for this. And I learned about it in this advocacy group with Passport. And by the way, they have a solution. So now all of a sudden you become a prospect. And right. so that's how you have to link it together. And I mean, every marketer knows this. We're not as successful. We can't be successful without the connected tissue with both product and then the go-to-market teams. It right. To but I think the key thing that I want to emphasize, and then we're going to bring invite Grant to the show. The key thing here is it wasn't, oh, you heard something and then, hey, I've got a great product for you. It was, you heard something, you connected that dot to more information, so you were helpful. And then at the point where you've sort of been helpful and now they kind of see it on their own. And I think that this is part of it is, you know, there's such impatience often because we're trying to get business to go straight from an input that you learned in this situation to an action. I love the way you connected the dots. All right, we're going to move on. We'll come back to you in, in, a, in a little bit. So let's welcome Grant Johnson, CMO of Embers. There you are. Hey, Grant. Hey, Drew. Great to join you once again. Yes, I have. Grant is the star of episode 249 and 287 of Renegade Marketers Unite. So, and where are you on this fine day? <laughs> you know, I'm actually on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Our uh, PE firm, K1, does four summits a year, marketing sales. I'm actually joining the finance summit since a lot of the Embers product is sold to the Office of Finance. I'm pick the brain of a few CMOs. Market research is fundamental to marketing. So it's a great day in Palos Verdes. <laughs> there you go. God, I love that. Only we played tennis against them in high school. So that's about the only time I spent there. Anyway, on your LinkedIn profile, you of course went to undergrad and grad school in California and have spent most of your career on the West Coast. So what, you spent a couple of winters in Boston and just said, no, thanks, don't don't need that? Yeah, it was a great first CMO gig from 2009 to 13 at Pegasystems. But yeah, after four winters, I'll remember coming back to escape a winter. My wife and I were driving and we looked at each other along PCH and we didn't have to say anything. We, we both knew it was time to come back. Four winters. Yeah, I, I love the East Coast to visit. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm a California by at heart, but I married a girl from Buffalo, New York, and she loves the season. So there you have it. So exactly. one quick question. What was the worst job you ever had? And what did you learn from that experience? Yeah, early in my career, I was hired to be a, a marketing manager. The company was a bit in trouble. And uh, the director was trying to find a way out of the current situation and asked me to go put together a plan. And so like, there's the, the room, go in there and come back in a month with the answer. And I was just miserable because as a more outgoing person who really enjoys working with teams and my personal mission is to move others to action. Makes sense that I'm in marketing leadership, right? And I just was stuck in a room, you know, and uh, I couldn't imagine a worse career path than being an individual contributor working on plans versus you know, working with teams. So needless to say, I went on to my next career assignment on my own accord because that was not for me. There you go. All right. Well, so now we're talking customer marketing. And I know in Burst, you have a lot of brands, although there's consolidation going on. Give us a sense of an overview of your customer marketing strategy and how important it is. 
Yeah, it's really critical to our growth. I uh, started it together with our head of uh, our CRO and uh, head of customer uh, success. And, you know, from the inception, we felt that we needed a flying formation, uh, aligned teams that we would set mutually shared goals. And we've just grown the business. I had one person to start. Now I have three. I'm sure I'll have four or more next year. As we've grown the, the customer marketing, we've also matured our sophistication. I would say we never did spray and pray, but we knew who the customers were. Um, we're orchestrating more how we how we contact them, when we contact them, you know, what offers we make to what segments or cohorts at what times, and you know, bringing those customers along on their own journey to spend optimization, which is really what we offer, help companies optimize their spend across a continuum of you know, expenses, invoices, and, and cards. You mentioned people. You have three people. What are, they, what are their roles? What do they do? Right. There's a leader who's the director who started as the first person in the group. Um, and oversees it. But we have, as you said, we have multiple product lines. And so we have a certain cadence. There's a certain sophistication and depth of configuration within an enterprise customer. So we have one person overseeing that. That's the leader. And then we have one for our what we call our mid-market customers. And then we just added this year because we've been adding a lot of, we have over 18,000 customers, a lot of SMB customers. They have unique needs. They probably don't avail themselves to our entire portfolio. They don't really need that, you know, those solutions, if you will, but they can certainly add one or two or three more. And so by having folks, they all help each other, but they specialize in one of those three major market segments. And what's great. So one of the things that came up in the huddle today that we had was this notion of making sure that your individuals in, the, in this department have the expertise that they really are subject matter experts. And so one way of helping you get there is by breaking up into these segments. How do you make sure, and this was an interesting question that, that came up, which is, you know, these jobs are sort of somewhat service and somewhat sales. And sometimes it's hard to find a salesperson who can really be a subject matter expert or a subject matter expert who can really sort of move a conversation along. I'm curious where you, the role of your folks, are they more on the success side or the sales side or whatever you want to call it? Yeah, I, I would think they're more on the customer engagement side. It's just, I mean, it's, I have just, I guess I've given you a third option, right? Sure, because right. I, they have to be tight with customer success. You know, is this a net promoter or is this account in trouble? They've got to be tight with sales. Like, you know, is this a compelling offer to make? I mean, does the customer care? Do we give them a 30-day trial? But really the engagement, like I'll give you an example. We recently implemented Pendo, as many other companies have for in-app messaging and marketing. And the first thing we did failed miserably. And, you know, people would run in the hallways if they were in a hallways, not a virtual, and they'd be crying about it. So, but, you know, we learned. What do we learn? That's the most important part. So we're going to adapt the next in-app offer that we do that was probably overwhelming the first time. And so just being adaptive, and making sure we have engaged customers. We've got an event coming up. Part of our customer marketing is our both virtual and in-person in Chicago. We'll have a coming up next week of 100 attendees. And which to us is the right, right number, right? We weren't looking to get 1,000, but those that want to travel in person. And uh, we've really curated the content and the customer marketing teams involved in that. We, you know, we've got a penetration to certain verticals like professional services or higher ed. And so we've got birds of a feather get-togethers. That's more value for the customer, right? And so within that, they'll have somebody talk about how they've adopted some other part of our portfolio. That's so much more effective than us sending 10 more emails, if you think about it, right? Yeah. Okay. Boy, a lot of thoughts going on there in terms of, first of all, just admitting that you tried something, it didn't work. We're going to fix it. Thank you for just sharing that. There's a, a few CMOs who will be listening to this who go, yeah, oh God. But then let's just, before we get to the next segment of the show, give us an things that you are doing to ensure customer satisfaction. You mentioned the Chicago event. So let's talk about some of the other things that you're doing. Yeah, if we could bring up the landing page, we actually use, we have a community called the Inverse Collective. If I could just give you a visual tour that it, the picture would, would really tell the story fast. So I don't know if you can see this here on the screen, but it's yep. just, if you, if you log into the, the, the Inverse Collective, we just came up with that fun name, collectively helping each other. And you can see like, Hey, there's a focus group. Is analytics? Do I need analytics for my business? Let me find out, right? Inversion Motion is the name for an in-person event. 
Uh, you know, if you're a new customer getting started, you can see there, how do you collaborate with other peers? They might have answers to things that you're doing uh, in sharing your source. What, what's product news that's relevant to you? So it's really a self-guided customer-driven portal and you get the value out of it that you want. The time you invest, you know, do some fun things and you, know, you can see there, uh, you know, welcome and, and humanizing work is our mis brand mission anyway. And so it's, it's gamified like a lot of these. You can see everybody's an optimizer and you can get to the next level if you want to participate. You know, we do have fun with it, but we try to make it that the customer can decide how much they want to get involved. They want to do a case study. They want to go to a and burst in motion, a in-person event. So that's really how we've constructed it, that we can have a constant pulse that customers can help stay connected versus us just always like, hey, let's reach out once a quarter, or, you know, send an email every three weeks. Got it. Okay. And you're using uh, Influitive for that? That's right. Yeah. that's a, We've had that for over three years and they've worked with us. We've adapted it. It originally was one of our product lines. Now all customers can join the collective and, you know, learn kind of like yours, uh, share, dare, and care, certainly uh, share and care with each other. Excellent. All right. Well, speaking of share, care, and dare, it's time for me to do a little, uh, little commercial, if you will, the plug for CMO Huddles. So CMO Huddles was launched in 2020. It's an exclusive community of over 100 highly effective B2B CMOs who share, care, and dare each other to greatness. Everything about CMO Huddles is designed to be a force multiplier, helping you, the CMO, make faster, better, better and more informed decisions where one inspiring hour a month delivers 10 hours of perspiration saved. Since no CMO can outwork their job, CMO Huddles is here to help you outsmart it. And since we happen to have three huddlers here, I would love to bring them back and say, hey, anybody want to share your experience? Uh, let's see. How about Marka? Would you like to share your experience so far? I would be thrilled to, Drew. So the, the wonderful thing about being a part of CMO Huddles is you get connected, or we I have been connected with some incredibly smart folks. All of us have certain disciplines that we're good at. You can be on a conversation with somebody or in one of the huddles where you talk about marketing automation, for example, and then you pipe up and you say, yeah, I'm really struggling with my current platform. And the next thing you know, five people chime in and say, yeah, I'm struggling too. And then five other people will say, well, here's how I solved that problem. So it's real time um, solution based feedback. And then you can go off and have your own conversation outside of the huddle itself. And I've found that to be extraordinarily fruitful. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. What would you say? I think it's a, again, you know, to echo Marka's uh, comments, uh, amazing community. I can remember at least a couple of instances where Terminal is a technical talent marketplace, and I was uh, keen to understand uh, how some of the other CMOs might set up their marketplace teams, and uh, it was uh, fantastic. It's it's a great way to learn from others in a low pressure, low stakes way. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Grant, any last insights? Well, it, well don't go it alone. It, well, the first time I was a CMO, I didn't, there wasn't huddles around. So we can all benefit from the learnings of others who pioneered certain paths that we aspire to, as well as share some of our experiences. And exactly as Mark and Tasha all said, on a few occasions already, I've connected with other folks, mostly for other people on my team that, hey, we want to do this. And, and they have somebody who's done that or and people are always willing to share, which really makes it a great community. I love it. Let's talk about the business value of customer retention. And when we're putting together quarterly or annual growth plans, and it'll be interesting because hopefully we're still all looking for growth next year, current customers could be, I don't know, 25, 50% of growth. I'm just curious, and we're among friends here, is this range about right for you in terms of growth and how you look at it? I'll jump in. I think, I think that's a good, good range I, for us. Yeah, I'm thinking about our net new bookings target and from existing customers for, for what we call cross sales, 25%. But if you, you know, if you add in retention and what we call upsell, additional seats, for example, uh, it could be up to 50%. It's, it's pretty significant. Okay. That's, would, go ahead. I would echo that. I think from our perspective, it's probably on the higher end on the 50% range because you're looking at that upsell opportunity. Let's just say for argument's sake, the current customers could end up making 50% of your growth goals. Did they get 50% of the budget? 
we don't necessarily allocate it in, in that sense. There's also a few factors to, to consider, right? If you think about uh, it, it costs more to acquire a customer or turn prospect into a customer than to, you know, uh, retain a customer and grow that customer. And so the approach to, you know, saying that, hey, if 50% of revenue is coming from existing customers, then should we be putting 50% of our budget there, that wouldn't fly because it costs a lot less to grow these customers. I have experimented, at least uh, in my prior lives, uh, just carving out some budget for customer marketing alone um, and, and you know just treating it as a separate bucket overall. But yeah, I think in general, I would say it varies between uh, 15 to 20%, I would say. I, I have not uh, allocated uh, much more than that to customer market. Market Grant, do either of you have separate budgets? And, you know, I mean, how do you look at budgeting for customer marketing? So I'll, I'll chime in because I think Grant's answer might be different given what I've heard about his organization. But I have a budget and it's more tactical in nature in terms of how it's split. And then based on those tactics, you go after net new versus customer. So it's I don't have it broken out separately from customer marketing, existing customers versus net new. Um, it's the way my budget works. It's more around the tactics that we employ. So whether it's events versus digital versus, you know, I've got a government relations piece of the business, et cetera. So that's the way I look at it. And, and so Grant, let's take the example of your customer event in that you mentioned in Chicago, where you're having a hundred customers there. Where's that budget come from? Well, and I mean, I know what's, I assume there's one big marketing budget, but is there events and cause there could be prospect events too, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. We, we have a dedicated customer marketing budget. That's part of it. The four events we do in, in North America and, and a couple in, in Europe, we do invite prospects. Uh, we, we had one in New York a, a few months ago. We didn't have, we had like 15 prospects so far, Chicago, I said a hundred customers, maybe, maybe there'll be 10 prospects. Who knows why that they're in other states at this time. Uh, we thought we would get as many there as New York. But yeah, so it's dedicated. The Influitive app for that whole community, that's part of a dedicated budget as well as the incentives that we offer for participation. We find that, uh, I think as Tajal said, it is a lot more efficient for us. And so we don't have to allocate that much of the budget because there are customers. You got to keep in mind that there's a whole customer success organization and customer support. And if they're adding additional functionality, implementation team. So they are getting surrounded by a lot of, you know, human resource as well to make sure their experience is satisfactory and sustainable for their advocacy long-term. But uh, we absolutely have dedicated people and programs and can, will continue because the return on investment's been, been really good so far. Interesting. So I want to get back to that, but as I'm thinking about it, the way, if I added up all the dollars of customer success and customer service and customer marketing, it might add up to a pretty big number that might rival your acquisition numbers. So I, I guess that's one way to do it. But you did mention the term ROI and that's sort of the next area of this. How are you, because all of these programs have different elements, right? I mean, we have events and we just want someone to get engaged. How do you measure effectiveness of your customer marketing? And Grant, you said good ROI, so let's start with you. Well, yeah, they're all in, you know, Salesforce and, you know, in gain side. And if there's an active opportunity, do we accelerate or, do, you know, because we introduce our new analytics pro suite did, did they try that out. And, you know, we report on it quarterly. We like every company we have, you know, KPIs, OKRs, one of those, you know, three other acronyms. You know, we're looking at you. You had a guest uh, recently talked about, you know, the customer journey and how many touches and. And uh, so we're, we're looking at that. I mean, that this really, especially when you can meet in person and have that one-on-one -on -one session, uh, we can see that it's a, an accelerator to uh, trying to, you know, close some additional sales. And therefore, we can see the ROI. And then we'll, we'll spend over 100000 on these physical events. They're not inexpensive, mind you, as you, I think you well know. So we're looking to get, you know, you know a couple million in pipeline. So we have ambitious goals, but so far, so good. Right. As we say... Revenue in the room. <laughs> so you spend a, a hundred thousand, but there's two billion in revenue in the room, or whatever the number is. If that makes sense, Mark uh, or Tejal, um, Where, what, from a measurement standpoint, what are your go-to's? Go ahead, Tejal. 
I think similar to what Grant shared, you know, uh, we use a similar approach and I found that approach to be very helpful, uh, which is looking at equating number of touches or tracking number of touches and seeing how that eventually affects any kind of cross-sell, upsell retention opportunities. And you do that enough number of times, then you're able to measure it at an empirical level and uh, really uh, get a sense for do the number of touches increase the the likelihood to to cross sell upsell and hopefully close additional uh, pipeline and what you're really looking for there is sort of correlation right is that we if we do this 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 and this and the, and we should get this outcome uh, Marka, anything to add in that measurement area so there's one metric that I hold the team accountable or we all hold ourselves accountable to, and it's the the ARR that we influence. So the, the revenue that we influence as a percentage of overall pipeline target for the year of those customers that exist in the cross sales that you're trying to get to. So if, you know, 50% of our pipeline is coming from existing clients, then how many of those existing clients, what's that, what's that percentage of the pipeline that we want to influence based on the pipeline that we have? And how do we go about and do that? So that's kind of at the top level from an OKR perspective, how we look at it. And that's done through digital means, that's done through government relations means, that's done through webinar slash event means. So all of those things ladder up to that overall metric. Interesting. Okay. All right. We're going to come back to that, but now is the point in the show where we have to ask, what would Ben Franklin say? And I think part of this whole conversation is that we're talking about, you have a good product, you have a great product and your customers are, should, they're probably happy with what it is that you're providing and, and you shouldn't hide that. So I think what Ben would say is hide not your talents, for they, for use were made, what's a sundial in the shade? Okay, so we're not going to hide our talents. We are not going to put a sundial necessarily in the shade. Customer marketing is, we got to bring it out into the sunlight. So I, I want to sort of get at this notion of these separate worlds of customer marketing. In Huddles today, we had a number of folks talk about how NPS, Net Promoter Score, was the this magic number for a set of people, not everybody, but for a set of people. And because they didn't want to measure them in sales, they didn't want these folks to be forced to, because what you incent, right, is, is what people do. So talk a little bit about these separate, we've got customer support, we've got customer growth, and we've got one measured in one way and one measured in another way. Where do the twains meet? That's probably a tough question, but um, I'm going to add Grant. What's the structure here? Yeah, well, no, for us, there are actually two uh, separate components of our, our brand's uh, measurement system that I think I might have shared with you before. Right. Uh, the, we have a number of various metrics that you know, we use to, to gauge the growing strength of inverse in the marketplace. And certainly that promoter is one. And, but, you know, customer adoption, it's it, to some extent, it's, it might be more of an indirect. It's not to say that a dissatisfied customer is going to embrace your additional cross-sell products. It's, that's pretty unlikely. Even if you have like a flat net promoter score, if you have growing adoption of a number of products per customer across the portfolio, and maybe it's support times. They're kind of happy, but they just don't want to wait this long. You know, it's not the product's working. So you got to sort of dig into what the correlation between those two scores are not necessarily one moves in one direction. Therefore, the other one's going to move in the same direction. And that gets us into this area where when customer marketing programs aren't working, what's usually the problem? And this way we can cite about that you don't necessarily have to have existing, uh, you can cite uh, examples from your career. Tejal, you're nodding your head. What's not working if, if your customer marketing program isn't happening? What's usually the problem? It depends on the kind of customer program uh, that we're talking about, right? So, so the example that I just talked about where... We, if we are measuring, and this is not a case at Terminal, but I've seen this uh, uh, in, in my uh, prior experience. Uh, for instance, if we're trying to ensure that the customers are nurtured through several touches and we're able to essentially get them to convert, 
we would marketing needs that information from the account management team or customer success team in terms of who are the customers that we should be targeting, right, for these touches. If we are going to put up an event like Grant was talking about, we need that intelligence from customer success on the, with sufficient, you know, with high enough fidelity to really hone in on those few clients, few customers that we need to go after. Where I've seen that doesn't work so well is when um, that information exchange is not happening in an effective way, in a way where it supports the overall business goals for both customer success as well as marketing team. So I think it's critical to really understand what is the goal for a particular initiative or a project and, and really ensure that uh, the teams are, are really aligned on that. I'll, I'll give you another example that, uh, you know, at Terminal where we were trying to uh, make sure that we were producing enough customer testimonials, if you will, right? So how do we get the advocates to, to speak on our behalf and uh, essentially record it? And when I, for a while there, the, the process was set up where it was all pulled from marketing, essentially marketing requests every few weeks, every few months, who are the customers who are uh, successful that we could connect with and, and move this, you know, move towards testimonials. And after going through several rounds of pulling for customer names, we realized that this is, this is not very effective. And we flipped the switch, flipped the process and we said, all right, customer success. When you think you have a happy customer, you tell us who are those people that we should be reaching out to? And based on that, we also aligned various goals where customer success team was then responsible for on a quarterly basis, submitting two nominations for this. And the process just felt like it was finally effective and things were moving and we were moving a lot faster. So I think it's about understanding what the goals are, understanding where the friction is coming from, and then right. just realigning to, to make sure that uh, you're setting up the teams for, for longer term success. All right. Um, so Mark has some final words of wisdom for CMOs who are looking to strengthen their customer marketing programs. So Drew, I'm, I'm going to keep it really simple. If you're going to be successful in a customer marketing program, it's got to be a win-win. As a client, you know, you want something that's going to make you look good and you're going to benefit. And then obviously as the um, supplier, you're looking for information and you're trying to turn them into advocates. So whether you are doing webinars, whether you're doing digital programs, whether you've got some kind of advocacy forum the way the grant has set up, it's got to be something where you're receiving information and the client is getting something as well. So as long as you've got that win-win set up, I would articulate and advocate that your customer marketing program will be successful. And, and it's such a great point. It really is about a positive exchange of value, right? Because you're asking a customer to do something typically, and you better be giving them something of value to encourage them to do it. Okay. Grant, final words of wisdom. Well, certainly you need a dedicated budget and people, but to me, the most important factor in customer marketing success is customer understanding. Make sure your team really continually gathers that insight so they can be relevant and meaningful to customers who we want to adopt and more of our platform and, and retain customers for life. And I, I just thank you for sharing and re reminding us. So yes, we've got to have this one win-win situation. Well, you can't get to a win-win situation if you don't understand your customers, right? Because they're the ones that you're hoping to influence. You did mention budget. Okay, Tejal, one, one last way of uh, words of wisdom for CMOs looking to strengthen their program. In addition to what Grant and Marka mentioned, I would say customer success teams, your customer success teams are going to be your strongest partners for customer marketing success. Focus on uh, ensuring that you're building relationships, you have an advocate who understands how customer marketing can impact their job and how you can better partner together. Just ensure that uh, you're 
setting up a good relationship and just overall a framework for success there. Awesome. All right. Deja, Mark, uh, Grant, you're all great sports. Thank you, uh, audience, for staying with us. If you're a B2B CMO and you want to hear more conversations like this one, find out if you qualify to join our community of sharing, caring, and daring CMOs at cmohuddles.com. Renegade Marketers Unite is written and directed by Drew Neiser. Hey, that's me. The show is produced by Melissa Caffrey, Laura Parkin, and our B2B podcast partner, Share Your Genius. The music is by the amazing Burns Twins, and the intro voiceover is Linda Cornelius. To find the transcripts of all episodes, suggest future guests, or learn more about B2B branding, CMO huddles, or my CMO coaching service, check out renegade.com. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, and until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.